This is a teaching by Pastor Nico Sammons from ICU God Ministries Online. Pastor Nico has started a new series on the letter of Jude. The title of this message is Judgment on False Teachers. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we declare that you are a good God and we declare that you are a great King. Thank you that we can study your word today. It is my prayer that your Holy Spirit will open our minds and that he will open our hearts so that we will understand what you want to say to us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. The name of this letter from the Greek text is Judas, which is taken from the Hebrew or Aramaic name Judah. The actual name of this book, therefore, is Judah. This letter is one of the most ill-treated and ignored letters in the New Testament. Jude conveys a message for all Christians today. And that message is that there is a truth worth fighting for. It is not only written to you as one who loves the truth, it is also entrusted to you to preserve, to defend, to contend and to struggle for. The one striking fact you will discover in reading Jude's letter is that he likely refers to two extra-biblical books, the Assumption of Moses in verse 9 and the book of 1 Enoch in verses 14 to 15. History tells us that Jude had his own children and that his children had to stand before the Emperor Domitian, who, as you know, were persecuting the early church. It was around 90 AD and they were going to be executed. But when Domitian saw their hands, that they were caloused, and the hands of hard-working and honest men, he let them go. And so they had a good heritage with their father and was part of the family of Jesus Christ. When Jude wrote this letter, he did not intend to write what we now read in the epistle of Jude. You see, he intended to write a quiet, tender-hearted and soft little devotional that dealt with our common salvation. But the Spirit of God impressed upon his heart a new direction, and as he sat down to write it, he became concerned for the people that were being swallowed up by the heresies that prevailed during his day and age. Heresies, cults, and the denying of the basic doctrine of Christianity is not something that is new. In the Cross and the Crescent, Dr. Francis Steele of the North Africa Mission predicts an eventual union between apostate Protestantism as represented by the Word Council of Churches and Islam. I quote his warning in full. Two lines seem to be converging. One represents the various Christian groups as these lose their biblical distinctives and evolve to sort of a Unitarian Universalism, they fear to the left. The other line represents the great ethnic religions, Islam, Hinduism and Buddhism, as these purges themselves of their more objectionably carnal aspects and emerge clothed in a philosophical monism or universalism they fear to the right. Eventually the two will meet in a glorified religious group. 
Listen, Bible students, it has been around since the truth began, since the good news of Jesus was first proclaimed. There have been lots of people who have sought to change, to twist, and to pervert it. In Matthew chapter 13, we find the parable of the sower and the seed. As soon as the sower sowed the seed on the wayside, the fowls came and devoured them up. And so, it is in every age where the truth is proclaimed, there is always evil. Evil follows closely behind to devour and to snatch up the truth. C.J. Rolls summarized the epistle of Jude as the peril of apostasy and the prophet of faith. S.M. Coder calls this letter the Acts of the Apostates. Just like you have the Acts of the Apostles, this letter is seen as the Acts of the Apostates. Because the church was in a state of apostasy, which simply means a falling away from the truth. There were people in Jude's day who had the outward form of religious expression. They were wolves in sheep clothing, and they had a form of godliness. But as Paul said in 2 Timothy 3 verse 5, they denied the power thereof. They had an outward appearance, but no strength in their lives to change them. Jude really did not have the desire to hammer and foul these people about it, but it was the direction that the Holy Spirit took him. Jude 1 verse 1a says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. There are two men named Jude that are prominent in the Gospels. Jude, who was one of the original apostles, and Jude, the half-brother of our Lord Jesus. I believe the latter Jude wrote this letter. You will recall in John 7 verse 5, prior to Jesus' resurrection, even his own brothers did not believe in his true identity. In Luke 4 verse 24, Jesus told the people of Nazareth, No prophet is accepted in his own country. As you know, familiarity often breeds contempt, and this actually occurred within Jesus' own family. But when the brothers saw that how Jesus had conquered death, Suddenly all their doubts were dismissed and they were dispelled. All the evidence began to add up as they began to connect the dots. Yes, Jesus was who he had said he was, the Son of the living God. We learn in Acts chapter 15 that another of Jesus' brothers, James, had a leadership role in the Jerusalem church. Here Jude identifies himself by his relationship to James. Jude, a servant, also called a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Is it not amazing? If Jude had been a name dropper, he could have easily introduced himself, brother of Jesus, the Son of God. Look at me. No one likes a name dropper. Instead, it is a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. This shows us Jude's humility, does it not? More than one of his siblings, Jesus was now his saviour. Rather than his big bro, Jude was Jesus' servant, or literally his love slave. A bond slave or a love slave was a special group of slaves. 
After a love slave acquired his freedom, he continued to serve his master, no longer out of obligation, but now out of love. In Exodus 21 verse 2, Moses said, if thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. You know, we too are bound to the Lord Jesus. He holds claim to both heaven and earth, and certainly to our lives also. His Lordship demands our allegiance. We too are certainly the master's slaves. But once you know Jesus, His grace and His mercy and His gentleness, desire replaces duty and we serve Jesus no longer because we have to, but now because we want to. Jude 1 verse 1b says, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Jude wrote to Christians, this is us. The word sanctify literally means to be set apart, set apart from the world and set apart unto God. We are preserved because Jesus is our guardian and our protector. In Proverbs 18 verse 10, Solomon says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and is safe. A person becomes a Christian because God the Father draws them. And if they respond to that drawing, they put their trust and their faith in Jesus Christ. The important thing is to answer the call when it comes, just as we answer our cell phone when it is ringing. Jude finishes his greeting in verse 2. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. In Jude's mind and in his heart, it was not enough to just wish his fellow believers mercy, peace and love. It was not measured out by mere addition, but by multiplication. Mercy means God's compassionate comfort and care for his children in times of conflict and stress. Peace is the stillness and assurance that come from reliance on God's word. His purposes will always be accomplished. Love is the undeserved grip of God for you and for me and all of his dear children. A warmth and care that should then be shared with all others. Jude 1 verse 3 I says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. You see, guys and girls, initially Jude's desire was to write of our common salvation. That is the blessings that we all have in Christ Jesus. But another urgent issue was pressing upon his heart. He tells us in verse 3b, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Oh, a sermon on the aspects of salvation would have been a luxury. More pressing though was a defense of the faith. And here is why. Jude 1 verse 4 says, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude had encountered certain men. He calls them ungodly men. Obviously, false teachers, men who were denying the truth about God and the grace of God. 
You will remember in 2 Peter 2 verse 1, the Apostle Peter warns us, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Well, Bible students, Jude would say, they are already here. He exhorts his readers to fight for the truth. According to a church research survey done a couple of years ago, we as Christians too need to be fighting the same battle. For faith among Christians are slipping. Accepted views and beliefs are fading. Did you know that today approximately 50%, that is a half of so-called Christians in South Africa, now believes that Christianity is not the only way to eternal life. And when asked how one receives eternal life, only 32% said by faith alone. Something that we as Christians who are mostly biblical illiterate, take for granted. Almost the same percentage, 28% said it was by a person's actions that they were saved, and an additional 10% believed it was a combination of deeds and faith. According to a more recent poll, only one in three South Africans believe the Bible should be taken literally. One in three. Here are some more shocking statistics. Did you know only 35% of South Africans believe that moral truth is absolute and unaffected by a person's circumstances? Only half of all Christians believe the Bible is accurate in all the principles it teaches. Just 25% believe in Satan and that he is real. And only 35% of South Africans believers believe Jesus lived a sinless life, which is what he did. Here is how bad it has become. Among South Africans, the most quoted Bible verse is, God helps those who help themselves. The only problem is, that is not a Bible verse at all. It was actually a quote by Benjamin Franklin. Now here is my point I want to make. Churches across South Africa have done a poor job of contending for the faith. Jude tells us to contend earnestly. The Greek word means to struggle. In other words, we need to wrestle for the truth. One of my favorite stories is about a skinny kid from Bloemfontein who attended a small high school. They did not have a wrestling program, but he read a book on wrestling and asked one of the teachers if he would enter him in some of the wrestling matches in that region. And so the teacher agreed to help the skinny kid. This little guy was neither strong nor skillful, but he had one enduring quality. He refused to give up. He won every single wrestling match because he persistently held onto his opponents and wore them down. By the end of the season, he was undefeated and made it to the state finals for his weight class. The kid's opponent was a two-time state champion. As the skinny kid faced the state champion, the guy made a couple of quick moves and soon had the Bloemfontein kid on his back and about to get pinned. The wrestling coach knew his athlete was about to lose, and he could not bear to watch it any longer, so he turned his face away. 
Suddenly, the coach heard the roar of the crowd, and when he turned around, his kid was on top of the state champ, pinning him. He had won the match. The little guy bounced across the mat and hugged the coach and said, Coach, I won, I won. The coach said, Sure, son, but I missed it. I turned away just before you were about to lose. What happened? The kid said, Coach, that guy was really good. He had me twisted like a pretzel on that mat. But you know me, Coach, I never quit. I refused to give up. So I opened my eyes and there in front of my face was a big toe. I do not even know if it's against the rules or not, but I bit into that big toe with all my strength. And coach, it is amazing what you can do when you bite your own toe. This, I believe, is the same effort we should give to the defending of the Word of God. In Billy Graham's autobiography, in the final chapter, he asks a very important question. Is it not arrogance or narrow-mindedness to claim that there is only one way of salvation or that the way we follow is the right way? I think not. Do we consider it arrogant or narrow-minded when a doctor points us to the one medicine that will cure us of a particular disease. The human race is infected with the disease of sin and God has given us the remedy. Dare we do anything less than urge people to comply that remedy to their lives. Billy Graham concluded, over the last 60 years, I have crossed paths with people who hold every kind of religious and philosophical view imaginable. Often, I am moved by their commitment. But as the years have gone by, I have become even more convinced of the uniqueness and truth of the gospel of Christ. And in his book, Billy Graham goes on to explain the reasons he is so sure of the gospel, the authority of the Bible, the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, the proof of his resurrection, the changed lives that result from the preaching of the gospel. We too need to be equally sure of God's truth and to be relentless in its defense and declaration. And not only do we need to contend for God's truth, but also His grace. Notice the word lasciviousness. It denotes a license to do evil, which is not the meaning of grace. You see, God sets us free from the Old Testament law, not to act lawlessly, but to act in love. True liberty produces a love for God and a love for others, not a license to serve ourselves. On March 10th, 1998, a certain newspaper ran a news story entitled Bank Robber Praise for a Successful Heist. When I read the story, I could not believe it. According to informers, a man named Kenneth Brunner led his seven accomplices in prayer asking for God's protection just before they set out to knock off Herman's jewelry store. I am not making this up, Bible students. They prayed before they decided to rob the jewelry store. Brunner acknowledged, according to the indictment, that they were going to do bad things, but that they were not bad people. No one was hurt in the robbery and everyone was behind bars 
the next day. And I hate to tell you, it is true. This is how people today think. They are so blind to God's truth, they see no contradiction to being born again, knowing God and robbing banks, or sleeping with a boyfriend, or stealing from the company, or eluding on your income tax, or cheating on your spouse. God's grace frees us from condemnation so we can know Him and walk in His Spirit and to obey Him. You see, when His Spirit enters our spirit, He changes us from the inside out. In Galatians 2 verse 20, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If you say you are a Christian, yet nothing in your life has changed, and you are not becoming more like Jesus, there is a problem, and something is very wrong. The phrase born again implies a change. A change has taken place in my basic nature, and it is working its way out in my life. If you are truly born again, you will not be the same person you once were. You will love instead of hate. You will give instead of take. You will care instead of stare past the need. You will obey God rather than go your own way. Jude continues in verse 5a and says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this. Bible students, please remember and take note. This letter was a reminder of what had already been written to these believers. In fact, you can compare the next few verses in Jude with 2 Peter chapter 2 and you will be very surprised by the similarities. Many Bible scholars believe that Jude actually borrowed from Peter. It reminds me of a song released by Mariah Carey. Her record soared to number two on the hit charts. She and her band had not planned on performing the song. It was added to their collection the night before a scheduled television appearance. Someone had suggested that she sings an oldie, and she decided to choose a Jackson 5 tune entitled I'll Be There. Her band had to learn that song the night before the show, Mariah was shocked that a remix song at that stage and time, 22 years old, would become a hit single. In a sense, this is the letter of Jude. Perhaps it was a re-release of an old hit, 2 Peter chapter 2. It reminded believers of information they already knew, but that they needed to take very, very seriously. Let me also say, please not get all bent out of shape when one Bible teacher would borrow from another Bible teacher. In fact, here is a little trade secret for you. It happens all the time with pastors. We are not afraid to borrow from each other. A matter of fact, did you hear about the man who was preparing to teach a Bible study and he said he was determined. He said, I am going to be an original or nothing. It turned out he was both. In his book entitled Marina Developments, William Robert Blaine said, Originality is the art of concealing your sources. Hey, all truth is God's truth. It originates from Him, and if something He gives me helps you to live it or to say it better, then by all means 
you use it for the glory of God. You do not have to worry about quoting me. In fact, I probably borrowed it from someone else anyway. In fact, if you want to communicate something that I say to someone else, here is how you do it. The first time you quote me, you say, as Pastor Nico once said. The second time you quote it, you say, as a man or as a woman once said. The third time you quote it, you say, as I have always said. Arthur Schopenhauer once said, the wise have always said the same things, and fools, who are the majority, have always done just the opposite. Jude warns that false teachers are going to come, and those who are fooled and tricked into following will share their judgment. Jude now illustrates this with several examples. The first were the Jews that God delivered from Egypt. Jude 1 verse 5b says, How that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. The Jewish people in Moses' day had an awful and a very bad habit of listening to the wrong people. First, in Numbers 12, we read where Moses' brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam, opposed him. Later in Numbers 13, all of Israel listened to the ten unbelieving spies rather than Joshua and Caleb. Still later, in Numbers 16, they listened to Korah. The result, they departed this life because they followed bad counsel. Please don't make the same mistake. Jude gives us one more example of those who shared the judgment of those who deceived them. Jude 1 verse 6 says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he have reserved in everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. In this verse, Jude recounts the story in the context of Noah's days. Jude's phrase, which kept not their first estate, has been taken by some Bible scholars to mean there were fallen angels who crossed a God-imposed barrier to engage sexually with mortal women. Genesis 6 implies the same activity when it says, Now it came to pass that the sons of God, which is a biblical idiom for angels, saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. You see, God was not happy, and he was definitely not pleased by what these angels had done. Genesis 6 verse 4 continues, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. You see, these unions created a race of giants or freaks is evidence that the human gene pool had been perverted. Thus, God took extraordinary measures to clean house and to start over, hence the flood. As you know, God destroyed all but eight people in Noah's day in the big flood. Realize, this idea of sexual experiences with demons is not as bizarre as a theme as you might think. We hear about it a lot 
in our counseling offices. It even appears in the occult. It also appears in a lot of UFO literature. If you believe UFOs are demonic appearances, which I do, then what about sexual abductions? Could it be another instance of fallen angels leaving their proper estate, as Jude put it? This type of phenomenon has even been portrayed in the movies. There is a scene in a 1985 movie, it was called Cocoon, where a female alien got too familiar with a human. Jude's point, however, is less provocative. There were angels created by God. They had seen the wonders of God, the beauty of His presence and even His glory. Yet they chose to rebel and to go their own way. Now Jude warns us not to do the same. Jude 1 verse 7 says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Bible students understand Ezekiel 16 verse 49 makes it clear that homosexuality was not the only sin of Sodom. It was only one of its many sins. Pride, idleness, greed, apathy all played a part in God's judgment of the city. And yet here Jude makes it pretty clear that sexual perversion was on Sodom's list of sins. Understand, homosexuality is not natural, it is abnormal, it is a deviation from how God created the sexes, it is not how God designed us. That is what makes it a sin. On the one hand, homosexuals need to be embraced with God's love. They need to be invited to turn from their sin and to follow Jesus. On the other hand, homosexuality is evidence of people hardening their heart to God's truth. And Jude's point is that Sodom and all its citizens started out blessed. They had advantages, but the problem was that they failed to honor God and they failed to obey Him and His will. Please do not start out good and then turn your back on God. Why? Because in Luke 9 verse 62, Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. What does Jesus want from us, you ask? He wants total dedication and not half-hearted commitment. We cannot pick and choose among Jesus' commands and follow Him selectively. We have to say yes to the cross along with the crown. We must count the cost and be willing to abandon everything else that has given us security without looking back. Many people today do not want to believe that God sentences people to hell for rejecting Him. But this is clearly taught in all of Scripture. Sinners who do not seek forgiveness from God will sadly face eternal separation from Him. Jude warns all who rebel against ignore or reject God. With our focus on Jesus, we should allow nothing to distract us from following Him. Jude 1 verse 8 says, Likewise, these people with their visions. Here, Jude jumps back to the false teachers that had crept into the church. He says they are dreamers. Verse 8 continues, 
They defile their own flesh. They despise godly authority and insult angelic beings. In other words, they do not have proper and polite behavior and they have no respect for spiritual authority. Just as the men of Sodom insulted the two angels, see Genesis chapter 19, these false teachers make fun of any authority. They were arrogant, they were haughty and pretentious, they even had no fear of God. Many people in our world today, and even some Christians, mock the supernatural. Bible students, please take note that it is not biblical to do that. Some even deny the reality of the spiritual world and claim that only what can be seen and felt is real. Like these false teachers in Jude's and Peter's day, they are misled and they will be proven wrong in the end. Do not take Satan and his supernatural powers of evil lightly and do not become arrogant about how defeated he will be. You see, although Satan will be destroyed completely, he is at work now trying to render Christians complacent and ineffective. According to Jesus in John 10 verse 10, he steals and he kills and he destroys. And according to 1 Peter 5 verse 8, he walks about like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Jude 1 verse 9 to 10 says, Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. The heretics of Jude's day had no sense of spiritual proportion. The people in authority they spoke evil of extended even into the spiritual realm. It reminds me of some of today's bombastic preachers who get up and rail and shout vile nicknames at the devil and his demons. Please do not misunderstand me. I am no fan of the devil. In fact, I would never say a nice word about him, but neither am I arrogant enough to call him out and pick a fight. The devil, though soiled and sinful, is an angelic being, and he is powerful. Fight like a Christian, for only in Jesus is here no match for you and me. In Luke 10 verse 19, Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. But on my own students, I know I am no match for him. That is why we are told that Michael, though an archangel, that means he is an angel with some rank and some muscle, when he contended with the devil over the body of Moses, even he did not shout vicious threats. Rather, he resisted Satan, but in a humble manner. Michael made sure that he put Jesus between him and the devil. He showed respect for spiritual realities and the power of his enemy. And thus he said, The Lord rebuke thee. And this is my suggestion for all of you. Whenever you confront the devil, do not try to take him on on your own. Make sure that you put Jesus between you and him. We never have to live in fear of the devil. For 1 John 4 verse 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he 
that is in the world. James 4 verse 7 assures us, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. But that does not give us the right to act arrogantly as if we ourselves could take on the devil. Again, whenever you encounter the devil or his demons, always keep the Lord Jesus between you and him. Do what Michael did and say, the Lord rebuke thee. What are the lessons that we can learn from this Bible study? Number one, what changed James's and Jude's minds? What turned them from skeptics to leaders of the faith? Nothing short of the resurrection, for it is after that event that we see them numbered with the disciples in the upper room. Sometimes we think that by being nice, mowing our neighbor's lawn, baking him some cookies, or smiling when he drives by, we will convert him. Not true. There was no lovelier person than Jesus Christ. Yet his brothers did not believe on him until the cross and the resurrection. That is why it is imperative to preach Christ crucified. You can wave to your neighbor for 20 years and wave him right into hell. Or you can take the time at some point to say, you know what? Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead, and you must believe on him. Number two, false teachers in Jude and John's day claimed to possess secret knowledge that gave them certain or special authority. Their knowledge of God was obscure, mystical and beyond human understanding. The nature of God is beyond our understanding, but God in His grace has chosen to reveal Himself to us in His Word and supremely in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we must seek to know all we can about what He has revealed even though we cannot fully comprehend God with our finite human minds. Beware of those who claim to have all the answers and who belittle what they do not understand. Job 36 verse 26 says, Behold, God is great, and we know Him not, neither can the number of His years be searched out. And Moses tells us in Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Number three. How can we as ordinary Christians defend the faith today? Ponder these three ideas. Point A. We can defend the faith by knowing the truth. We do that by studying the Bible. Don't ever imagine that pastors and seminary professors hold a monopoly on this task. Without Bible study, you cannot know what to defend. You must understand the basic doctrines of the faith so that you can recognize false doctrines and prevent wrong teaching from undermining your faith and hurting others. Point B. We can defend the faith as we grow personally with Jesus Christ. While knowledge is important, your personal relationship with Jesus is essential. Through that relationship, God has given you the Holy Spirit as a teacher. Unattached to God, you may know everything but understand nothing. Attached 
to Christ, you are given spiritual understanding as well as experiences with Jesus that underscore your faith. Point C. We can defend the faith by remaining unified on the essentials. While Christians can certainly disagree on many non-essentials as the ways and means of music in worship, worship, and outreach, we must always defend the truth of the basics of our faith as found in God's Word. Number 4. The foundational theme of this wonderful epistle is an exhortation to keep ourselves in the love of God. It is the hinge upon which the letter of Jude swings. Jude's heart is, yes, there are heretics and deceivers, but you, beloved, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keeping yourself in the love of God does not mean earning God's love by being a good little boy or a good little girl. God's love is unconditional, so much so that in Romans 5 verse 8, Paul declares that God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When did God demonstrate his love for you and for me? Not when we were trying to be good Christians, but when we were pagans, heathens and rebels. When you couldn't have cared less about him, God looked at you and said, I love you deeply. Never buy into the thinking that you earn God's love by being good. Many Christians look at God as being like Santa. He's making a list, checking it twice, and he's going to find out who's naughty and who's nice. If you've been good, you'll get gifts. If not, you'll be lucky to get a lump of coal. But nothing could be further from the nature of our Heavenly Father. Making a list, checking it twice, Paul tells us the list of our failings was blotted out by the blood of Christ. The list of my sins and your sins was pinned to the cross of Calvary and cleansed so thoroughly by the blood of the Lamb that the writing became completely impossible to read. God's love for us is not based upon anything we do or do not do. For His love is unconditional. What then does it mean to keep yourself in the love of God? It simply means to keep yourself in the place where you can receive His blessings. In other words, God is constantly showering us with blessings, with His love and with His grace. He's not saying, Hmm, you've been bad today, so I'm turning off the faucet. No, God's blessings are always coming down. Then why aren't I being blessed? You ask. The answer is easy. You're not under the faucet or the spout where the blessings come out. You have wandered away. God didn't close the faucet, because even when we are faithless, He is faithful still. God doesn't monitor the flow of blessings depending on how we're doing. No, the faucet is on full blast all the time. Therefore, the only thing we have to do is to make sure we're in the place where we enjoy God's blessings, that we're standing under the faucet or under the spout where the blessings come out. Am I suggesting it is possible for a person to remove himself from the place of God's blessings? Yes, and Jude gave us three examples which we have already looked at. I want to conclude this Bible study on Jude part 1 with this thought.
Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to set you free and to give you hope for your future. He will forgive your sins. Hand them over to Him. Now is the time to make a decision and to follow and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have any questions or would like someone to pray with you, we would be happy to speak with you. Please give us a call at 082-828-2085. We are so excited for your new life in Christ Jesus. I will continue this Bible study teaching on the Epistle of Jude next time, so be sure to join us again.